I thought before I start, I just briefly introduce myself. Um, so I just recently moved to Penn State to the Department of Chemistry and, and Physics. And before that, I was a postdoc at the uh, Flight Iron Institute, you know, the Center for Computational Quantum Physics. And so what I'm going to be talking about today is a little bit the, um, you know, some work that we did at the Flight Iron and we are continuing right now on on these like quantum embedding methods, and you know it will be a little bit more from the um, you know physicists or um, quantum chemist side. But um, if there are any things that I should clarify and so on, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, the other thing is that I should say as a disclaimer is that my usually what I do or what I did for a long time is more you know um, topological materials or you know we are doing topology in, in molecules and so on. But I've always been interested in you know quantum chemistry or like up initial description of realistic materials and that's why um, we recently switched a little bit and switched gears a little bit and what I'm going to talk today uh, about today is basically some work that we did about really an up initial description of defects and so um, before I forget this and basically um, I couldn't have done this alone this is of course you know the people at CCQ or at other other places and the re one of the reasons why I'm, I'm showing this as well is, is because I think it's a very interesting mix of people. So, you know, there's Giancarlo and me, we come more from the symmetry slash topology side. Um, there's Malte Resna who comes from, you know, the CRPA or DMFT side of things. Um, Alex Hempel as well, and then Dennis was a, a student we worked with as well. But really the person who, you know, spearheaded this whole project and got us all interested, all from these like really different kind of communities into this, was Cyrus Dreyer, who, you know, he's a professor at Stony Brook and has a co-appointment at, um, at CCQ as well. So what I want to convey a little bit today as well is that, you know, this is really from maybe a more unique perspective from like a mi mix and match of different kind of people looking at these problems, right? And so what is really the essence of what I want to talk about? Um, we want to, which kind of systems do we want to study? So in the most simple case, basically, we want to study a material that we imagine as basically having a very, very large unit cell. And inside this unit cell, there's basically one, sign, one type of point defect that can be a vacancy, can be an add atom, can be anything, basically. It just has to be a point defect, right? And what we want to understand is, is basically how does that change the electronic structure, both of the host material as well as the um, defect itself, right? And so maybe it's just as a little cartoon, right? Like if you have most of these materials we're looking at are basically semiconductors. So if you look at the density of states, the Fermi level will be in a gap. And basically you have the filled bands and then the, the unfilled bands, right? And now when you introduce a defect there, you will get basically a set of discrete states these discrete states are these localized states that are close to the defect. And that's kind of what we want to describe. And so we want to find a way to basically find a Hamiltonian that can describe the host, um, the defect, and as well as the host defect interaction in some manner. And what we are interested in is basically describing these localized defect states as, um, as, as good as possible, but also, of course, um, in a way that's computationally feasible. And so, um, you know, maybe as a material science or somebody who does a lot, deals a lot with materials, it's kind of obvious, but I wanted to, to mention or bring it a little bit back because I think these systems are actually very interesting because usually um, when one looks at condensed matter systems, um, one usually doesn't um, ask a lot of questions about the defects. One asks questions about how do the defects change the properties of the material, right? So here's a, here's a plot of a material called tungsten ditellaride. And so what's being plotted here is basically the, the red dots are is the, um, the average mobility of the electrons. And this is basically as a function of uh, the triple R ratio, which basically is a um, measure for the purity of the crystal. And so um, the higher the triple R ratio, the more pure the crystal is, that is um, less defects, right? And so this is a very common occurrence. That is, if you have very quite a lot of defects here, the, for example, the mobility of electrons is very, very low. That, that means they scatter a lot, right? And so if you make it very clean, then usually the mobility becomes very, very large, right? And so usually defects make the properties of a material, right? We wouldn't have transistors without defect chemistry. Um, if we look at solar cells and so on, um, you know, defects are a big pain in the butt because they're basically um, decays, uh, they give uh, decay pathways that um, lower the efficiency of a, of a solar cell. So usually when we, or at least I, I think about um, 
defects in materials, we kind of think about how can we either avoid them or how can we understand how, to, um, how they affect the material, right? And so, um, but what these defects I'm going to talk about today, what is different is basically we're not going to ask the question, how will the defect affect the material, really? We're going to ask the question, how will the material affect the defect? Because what it turns out is that I've shown you this, um, this discrete states of these defects partially inside the band gap. There can also be resonances in you know, the, the bands. But basically what, what you find is that many of these defects, they have some sort of ground state and then an excited state. And usually this ground state um, is spin polarized or very often, right? And so then one can ask, can we understand the optical transitions in there? Can one understand you know, when you're excited, what are the excited states dynamics and so on? And so in order to understand what the properties of these defects are, you kind of have to understand what the host material does, right? So it's maybe a little bit different from what um, people normally talk about defects in materials. And so and another big thing, of course, is that um, experimentally, we would also like to know, can we predict these properties of the defects, you know, in which host material will they occur, what properties will they have, right? Um, sometimes even in, in several cases, um, I will show an example later, is there are people have very experimentally well-defined defects in the sense that they um, have very well-defined optical transitions and so on, but actually the microscopic origin, the microscopic structure of this defect is not known, okay? So that's also a little bit of a motivation why these kinds of um, approaches might be interesting. And so, um, another thing that is so interesting about these materials is really that these defects, because they have these discrete, discrete levels and um, they have usually like, you know, um, non-zero spin in their ground state, they can actually be used for a lot of uh, interesting applications in the quantum world, right? So uh, maybe some of you have heard about the NV minus center, right? That I think is probably the most famous one, which is extremely sensitive to external magnetic fields, e electric fields, and so on, right? And so you can basically use them as sensors for extremely small um, you know, fields or whatever at the micro scale. So people have actually used it to you know, go over a conductor or something like this and get local probes of these, of these materials, right? And so there's also something that, that, that tells you a little bit that there's enormous potential for these kinds of defects in, in technology, but in order to, to really use them, we really need to understand how we, you know, can we describe the lifetimes of these excited states, right? Um, can we somehow describe how these, um, these spins in these defects interact with the host system, right? Like, um, usually you don't have pure um, hosts, you have some an isotope disorder in some way, right? So there, there's coupling to non-zero um, spins and so on. And so these are really the big level questions why it's interesting to look at these kinds of defects, right? Um, and there's many, many different communities coming together, which, you know, which is why I got so interested in this. And so what one really then needs to understand is maybe a little bit the energy scale and the goal of what one wants to do. Of course, it's basically impossible to, on one hand, completely accurately describe the small localized defect and then the interaction with lots of you know, other spins and so on. So today I'm, I'm going to talk mostly about understanding the optical transitions that is the energy levels of these defects. And so here basically the energy scale is that of electron volts roughly, you know, they, they absorb in the visible light. And what we really want to do is then understand how, how these optical trans transitions work when we have you know, structural changes or dynamics of these um, these states, for example, many of these are excellent um, single photon emitters. And so, you know, um, usually they just decay back to the ground state, but they can also do an inter-system crossing, which quenches basically the photon emission. And so one would really like to understand which mechanisms can kind of prevent this and do this. And also, you know, while these optical transitions are on the electron volt scale, there's many, many different like microscopic scales in the, in the sense there's like, you know, the energy that it takes to make this defect, right? You destroy a bond or whatever. Um, you have the interaction with the bath or like this, the host material, right? Potentially there are many more defects and there can be defect-defect interactions and so on. And again, I just want to stress that um, often one doesn't really know what charge state, for example, this defect is, you know, what ex the exact chemical composition is. So kind of accurate uh, numbers from theory are very, very important. And so this really, to me, falls into um, the field basically that is like the field of quantum materials, right? We have a really a complicated interplay of many, many different um, effects, right? You have the defect and the host material, they have some symmetry in a specific chemical structure, right? You want to understand the spins and the magnetism. Um, Spin-orbit coupling is necessary to induce, to understand these uh, transitions. 
but also um, what turns out is that electronic correlations are actually extremely important, right? And so I think um, understanding what's going on in these defects is not only interesting from like you know purely, purely technolo technological side, but also just from a very fundamental um, physical and chemical um, perspective. And so yeah, what I'm going to talk about today is basically a, a preprint of ours, um, basically where we try to give like a little bit of an overview from our perspective on what the challenges are to model these kind of defects, right? And um, maybe possible routes to overcome this. Of course, we're not the only people doing this, but um, Basically, because we have some people with a background of these like um, dynamic and field theories and like this like physicist embedding theories, like maybe we can think a little bit about these problems from this perspective. And so, um, let me give a small motivation why um, these materials might be uh, interesting to study, also from the point of view of strong correlations. So I've just said before, many of these defects have some sort of point group symmetry, you know, in the threefold rotation or whatever they can be. And basically what, um, what one observes is that my, while the ground state might be very well describable by you know, mean field me methods such as DFT or you know, what, whatever you want to use as a mean field method, single particle method, very often the excited states are not even qualitatively describable using um, DFT, right? And there's an interesting way of thinking about this. This is due to Hong Yao, Yao and Steve Kibelson. So this was done in a completely different background. But um, I wanted to introduce it anyways because I think it's an interesting way of thinking about it. So let's say we have a material where we have some sort of single particle state n that could be a you know, molecular orbital of the defect or whatever. And then because we have time reversal symmetry, we'll always have a Kramers partner that we just describe as n tilde, which can just be obtained by applying time reversal symmetry, right? So you can think of n and n tilde, n -tilde as like spin up and spin down if you neglect spin orbit coupling, basically. And then we basically assume um, the absence of spin orbit coupling, that is, we have a spatial symmetry that basically, you know, some power of it will go to one that could be a mirror, so n is two, it could be a rotation, threefold rotation, then n is three, and so on. But basically, then we can choose a basis in which these um, molecular orbitals are basically eigenstates of this symmetry, and so then we can label them by the eigenvalues, which are just, like, you know, some numbers on the, on the unit circle, complex unit circle. And now, if you ask yourself, if I have a state n, and this has the symmetry eigenvalue lambda n, what is going to be the eigenvalue of its Kramers partners? And because um, time reversal is an anti-unitary symmetry, you will find basically you know, the symmetry and, the time, and time reversal commute. So you will find that basically if n has eigenvalue lambda n, then the state n tilde has eigenvalue lambda n um, star, so just complex conjugated, right? And so then we, if what follows from that, if we have a product state, so that is a state that just can be written as a um, product state of completely filled orbitals, right? So we have something that is an ob a spin up times the spin down in the same orbital. This state will always uh, transform into trivial point group representations, right? Because if we asked what the, if we let R act on this state here, we'll get lambda, lambda star that's equal to one, right? So um, every state that basically transforms as the um, identity or the trivial representation is, is, can be represented as a band insulating state, or most of them. So that's basically the statement. So you know, a product state transforms trivially under point group transformations. Okay, and so now um, we can basically um, make an opposite statement. So now, if we have a state that does not transform trivially under a point group representation, right? That means you cannot represent it just as like a product state um, if you want to conserve time reversal symmetry and one of these, uh, these spatial symmetries, basically. And so that is why when you have um, symmetries in play and you find states that have you know, non-trivial representations, I'm, I'm taking like you know, C to V, and you find this many body state that has a B2 representation, for example, you know you cannot just write it as a product states of fermions. So that also means that mean field methods will probably have a hard time describing it because it's a, you know, quantum mechanically, it's a multi-slater determinantal state. Otherwise, if it had a trivial, if it basically would be a trivial representation, you could just write it like this. And so that is for me a little bit, like, you know, from the point of symmetry, is like why these states can be actually interesting because maybe they are actually have an interesting many-body structure. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use embedding theories so to describe these states. So what do I mean by that? Um, we're basically going to take a chunk out of this crystal that has the, the defect, right, and going to try to accurately describe the defect in its environment, and then basically treat the rest of the system in some sort of like low-cost mean field way. 
right? And of course, you know, we're here standing on the shoulders of giants, so we're not the people who invented these kind of things. These have been uh, ongoing for years, so this is by no means any um, complete uh, reference, but um, what we are gonna do basically really um, builds on the work of Adam Gali and uh, Julia, where I think was here, right? So they were one of the first who used these kind of methods. Um, now there's actually a lot of quantum chemists who you know, don't do exactly the same way um, that we're doing it, but now the quantum chemists actually have um, entered the field and uh, they're doing it in their way, right? Where they use these quantum chemical methods such as couple cluster or you know, CASA-CF and whatnot to study these things. So I think it's actually an interesting time because now we are having the opportunity to actually benchmark different theories with each other, right? Of course, they have um, methods that have very high costs, so they can only really be used for benchmarks, but that's already very, very important, as I will show you in, uh, in a second. And so, basically, what we're gonna do is basically, we're gonna base it on DFT and then do some high-level exact diagonalization. There's been a lot of work on just using DFT and post-DFT to describe defects. But as I said, many of these excited states um, cannot be desc really described, properly described with DFT. And so that's why um, they, they struggle a little bit. There's also a lot of people who have used finite-sized clusters, right, that build just three-dimensional finite-sized models of a defect and then passivate it with hydrogen atoms and so on and then use the quantum chemical methods. But that's also the problem here is that these are very expensive and they're very hard to converge due to finite size effects. Um, and so what we really want to do, as I said, is we're going to take a small subsystem and then treat it with a very high accurate method. And so let me just tell you how we're going to do this by using the NV minus center as a, uh, as a benchmark. So we did this to reproduce the, uh, basically the work has been done previously uh, by other groups using this similar method, but basically with our implementation. And the reason why we're gonna use this uh, NV minus center is just because it's experimentally one of the few defects that are extremely well characterized. You know, we know their symmetry. Um, we basically know, you know the absorption and emission lines extremely well. So this is a very excellent way of benchmarking our theory. And so if you look at basically what is the energy level diagram of this defect, so basically you have a diamond and what you do is you replace one carbon with an, a nitrogen atom and then you just remove or introduce a vacancy next to the nitrogen one. And then basically you have these like dangling bonds of the nitrogen and these three carbons um, forming like these defect states. So this is an extremely localized defect in a very large band gap um, insulator. So that's why it's also a good test. And so here basically what you'll find is that you have a ground state triplet that then splits under small magnetic fields. And then there's an excited state triplet as well, which is doubly degenerate. And then there are two, there are two basically um, singlet states, which then um, can be probed by basically intersystem crossing. And so, you know, what we ideally want to describe is basically, you know, this zero phonon line. So what we need to know for that is basically we need to know the ground state structure of the defect. So what we do for that, we take DFT and actually optimize the geometry because the ground state is actually a triplet and um, for triplets, this, this what I showed you before doesn't occur, so you can really describe it extremely well using density functional theory. But then we want to also describe basically the excited state because we want to optimize the structure so we can find basically the uh, optimal uh, geometry to describe the zero phonon line, right? So when something absorbs, it falls back and then goes down. And so what you can do is basically there are approximations within DFT where you can at least um, qualitatively describe how the ge geometry looks. But of course, that's also a goal in the future is to be able to use these embedding methods to optimize the structure. So I'm just saying this as a caveat. Okay, so how does the method work? How, how do we use this? So basically what we're doing is we're doing a DFT calculation of a, of a large supercell with a defect in there. And so, you know, basically before I showed you the cartoon, but basically you'll find, you know, here's the valence band and the conduction band of diamond. And then you'll find, um, four extremely flat states, which means they're extremely localized, which are just the defect states. And if you label the molecular or the orbitals of this defect state, you'll just find that they have these um, representations of the um, C3V point group. And basically there's a degenerate representation. And um, basically the state is such that these two states are completely occupied and then there's two electron in these um, degenerate states and then they basically form a triplet. So that's how you can understand the ground state. And what we then do is to basically isolate these bands. So our goal is basically to find a Hamiltonian that describes only these defect states while taking into account the, the host material is. 
what we're going to do is we're going to do a vanierization. So we're going to find localized orbitals, basically, that reproduce the energetic structure of these like localized um, orbitals. And what this gives us is basically um, effective hoppings that already incorporate, to some extent, the effects of the host material, right? Because there's going to be some uh, renormalization of, of bonding and so on coming in. And so then what we want to do is we want to define the correlated subspace, which we want to basically solve exactly. And so for that, we basically build a, some sort of quantum chemical Hamiltonian. This Tij are basically the, you know, the single particle terms. These we get from the vanierization, um, basically for free. But then the big part, of course, is we want to describe the Coulomb interaction between the electrons in these states very accurately. And so we're going to really build the full Coulomb tensor for all these four states. Then we're going to basically introduce a chemical potential just to make sure that you know, the right number of electrons is there. And then there's basically the, one of the most important terms here, which is the double counting, because um, we are using DFT. So DFT, to some extent, already has a mean field description of the electronic repulsion of these electrons, right? And so we don't want to treat this doubly. So we have to dis um, basically remove this double counting. But that turns out to be the, um, the weak point of the methods where one, I think, needs to do a little bit more work, right? Because there's no explicit expression for the double counting term. Um, due to DFT just being formulated in terms of the density, and here we do it in an orbital dependent way. Can I ask a question about yeah. this one? First, is double counting a quadratic term? Um, we're assuming yes, because basically, you know, the, the DFT Hamiltonian is basically also just a single particle Hamiltonian. So, um, but of course, um, we also need to account. Basically, I'll, I'll talk in a second about how to obtain these like Coulomb matrix elements because they will require some taking into account the host material as well. So some DFT goes in there as well. It's not like just to project with respect to the bare Coulomb. That you need. No, we're going to use um, the constrained random phase approximation. So basically, you know what is happening if you would just take these one year orbitals and basically just do what you just said. You, you just take the orbitals, right? You have the Coulomb interaction. You can take the real space integral and calculate all these uh, things, we'll see that there might be an order of magnitude too high, right? So I think if we do the bare Coulomb um, repulsion integrals, and they're on the order of like 10, 10 EV, 12, 13 EV or something. But if you actually get back the screened ones, they have more of the order of two to three EV, right? So there's basically these, these states of the host material screen the uh, Coulomb interaction of the electrons in the defect states, and that's what we have to take into account. And we're doing this through the constrained random phase approximation, where basically you calculate a, a polarization um, in the random phase approximation. And, but what you do is you don't take into account any diagrams that involve interactions between defect states, only um, between defect and um, basically the host material. And so the idea is that basically through this like downfolding, through getting the Coulomb interaction, um, in this like small subspace, um, the screening is the basically what the host material is going to do is just going to screen the Coulomb interaction, and that's basically the main idea in this um, this model. Um, and by omitting the screening, like the defect defect screening, um, we don't get any problems with double counting in our um, in, in the many body part because that's exactly what will come out by solving it exactly. Okay. So, so, so does that mean you, so you, you start with the Coulomb calculated ones and then screen them? Yes. So um, let me say basically, um, I skipped a little bit. So we can basically, we have the Vanier functions and we can just calculate the bare Coulomb interactions between this. So this is this like little v. And then we're going to use this like polarization from uh, CRPA to get the screen Coulomb propulsion. In general, this uh, screen Coulomb propulsion is uh, frequency dependent, but we're just going to look at the frequency independent um, omega zero, basically. Um, and so this approach, um, you know, we're not the first ones to use um, for the defects, of course, but also these kind of approaches have been extensively used in, you know, DMFT and whatnot um, to describe strongly correlated crystalline systems. So um, that's a little bit where the point of view where we came from, that um, this is at least gives you an idea of the order of magnitude, you know, some up initial guess of the order of magnitude of what these Coulomb elements are, because basically, right, if we would try to take into account all these valence bands, our Hamiltonian would be intractable uh, really, really soon, right? And What's so- What's the benefit of one-year localization in this step? Sorry, the what? 
what's the benefit of a one-year localization? Is that so because possible? we get local orbitals, right, and we can basically be project on some states. You can also do it without one-year uh, localization. You can just take the Concharm states if you want. Because you, you don't have any interpolation step here, so you can do whatever. Yeah, it's just, um, for example, in VASP, the way the program we're using VASP, it has the CRPA included. They um, they also have projectors, but the reason we wanted to do this with the Vanya functions is because if we have the Vanya functions, we can actually easily uh, determine the symmetries of these orbitals or calculate the symmetries of the many body states. Um, there's certainly no a priori reason why you should do Vanya states and so on. Um, one thing we were th thinking of as well is like because these Vanya functions will usually be localized, there was the question if can you successively, you know, um, in the end, we're going to do a very, very big supercell and only use the gamma point, and then there's going to be a lot of states that backfall basically on the gamma point. And so can you, success, can you basically make this model more and more accurate by including more and more states, and then basically you select those states um, whose Vanier functions are localized very, very close to the uh, uh, impurity, right? So you could either do this, of course, again, do projection. Um, Vanier functions just give you a very nice picture. What is the concentration of the... Defect. So, are they in each unit cell or are they? Yeah, so the idea is basically you take one defect in a unit cell and you make the unit cell very, very large, but of course there's like, you know, periodic replicas of these defects. So there's one in a very big unit cell. So, yeah, so we go up to like, I think, 512 atoms in a unit cell, of, um, roughly. So, but of course one needs to converge because this is, is an artificial, um, uh, basically it's too high of a symmetry, right? Because these, these defects could interact with each other if these cells are too low. And so that's also something that we benchmark as to like, you know, how bad is this convergence and all of this. Okay. Um, okay, so basically let me reiterate, basically we want to solve this Hamiltonian H. Um, this TIJ we get from the vanierization, this UIJKL we get from CRPA. And these are readily available in, you know, VASP or other ab initio codes. Um, what basically the assumptions or challenges of these methods are is what we wanted to understand um, is how does this downfolding depend on the DFT functional, right? So like you could say if I use GGA for diamond, I get a band gap of, I don't know, I underestimate a little bit 4.5, right? If you use HSE, you over, might overestimate it a little bit, right? If you use some other functional, how, how, how much does, do our results depend on the starting point? And again, how much do our results depend on Vanier function and CRPA, right? Because um, depending on which choice of, which localization one uses, or you know, sometimes one has to disentangle states from the bulk and the defect, how sensitive are these results to actually these more um, intrinsic problems of these methods, right? And then, of course, the, the big elephant in the room is like, how can we, can we maybe find a more systematic way of understanding what these double counting effects are for these defect states, right? I mean, there's a huge swath of literature of understanding double counting in DFT in general, um, especially for this like, you know, dy dynamical mean field theory. Um, but basically, because these systems are actually um, very localized and they can also be, uh, they, are, they are also accessible in the future through quantum chemical calculations or high accuracy, you know, quantum Monte Carlo, Shi Wei Zhang, for example, is working on this. Um, can we basically, for these very small systems, can we figure out maybe a, a better way of describing the, um, the double counting, right? And um, then again, of course, you know, this is basically, we used a very minimal basis. We just had the four defect orbitals and then downfolded using CRPA. But also, is there something, you know, how, how does the screening depend on the number of empty bands one uses and the size of the active space and so on, right? And so I think that was really our motivation to see, like, I th we think that really requires a careful benchmarking and comparison to experiments and other high-level methods, right? It's very easy to use, but I think with everything, you can, you can go horribly wrong. And I, I will go from good to worse in what I show you. Um, and so maybe also, um, I wanted to just highlight how our approach is a little bit different from like common quantum chemical approaches, right? So in quantum chemical, what you do, you just usually have a set of frozen occupied states, you know, like some core electrons or electrons that have different symmetries, whatever, right? Then you define an active space which consists of occupied states and unoccupied states, and then you have some frozen unoccupied states, right? 
And then basically, if you want to convert your results, you just like slow, slowly increase the active space until you basically go span, the active space spans just the whole set of orbitals, right? So this is a very systematic approach. But we are not kind of doing this. Our active space is kind of staying the same. If we first choose our defect states through vanillization, they stay the same. What we are doing is really, um, we are really um, increasing the active space by taking into account more empty states through the uh, constrained random phase uh, approximation. So that's where our downfolding and our convergence comes in. So it's a little bit different from what quantum chemists usually do. And one of the reasons is that with this approach, our Hilbert space actually remains rather small. You know, you can almost solve these um, models exactly. Of course, if you have more complicated ones. Yeah? I want to add that we can do what you're talking about, but we typically don't do it. <laughs> yeah, I, I've talked to uh, Tim Berkelbach, and he, I think, is also interested in implementing some sort of like downfall, like downfalling of Coulomb um, for quantum chemical systems, if that's what you're talking about. No, I'm alluding to the fact that we use five categories of orbitals. Uh, but I think what we, we use a similar language to describe different things. So we would have really frozen, uh, we would have restricted occupied and frozen occupied. And the restricted are the ones that you would like to include in your constrained RPA, and the frozen would be the one excluded. So mm -hmm. we could, in principle, do that. Okay. Yeah. Yep. I'd be interesting to hear, hear more, actually, yeah. Um, you know, I, I have a little bit of background in quantum chemistry, but I, I, it's been a long time, to be honest. So um, I'm always happy to like, learn more about what I've forgotten, basically. So, um, yeah, let me come back. So we, we want to basically work with a small active space because it allows us to solve it extremely accurately, but also maybe interpret the results a little bit easier. We can make effective model, you know, maybe we don't have to take the full Coulomb tensor, there's some dominant Coulomb interaction. And then, really what I think is the um, bottleneck of the method in terms of just computation is just the CRPA step, right? So. Um, I think normal RPA basically scales with n to the, uh, n, you know, the system size to the power of four, right? Um, there's some implementation where you can go lower, but still the prefactors can be pretty large. And you know, if you need to store uh, things on a high uh, frequency grid, it soon becomes very costly, right? So um, that's also something to think about. How can one, for example, um, optimize this step a little bit better if one wants to do a geometry optimization? Otherwise, you would have to do uh, the vanillization and CRPA for each geometry and so on. So are there maybe ways you can skip some of these points or interpolate the, the CRPA steps and so on, right? So, mm -hmm. Sorry, just, just to build on your comment and uh, you know, or the way that uh, you, you are presenting the fact that you want to keep the RPA small. I understand, of course, the need to keep it small, but you know, we have done a lot of studies about uh, how the choice of the active space in quantum embedding for defect is actually affect the result. Yeah, yeah. So if it, and also affect the dependence on the starting point of the DFT. So uh, I'm not completely sure that the keeping the active space small and insisting on defining only the uh, minimum model is the best way. No, for sure. If you want quantitative, you know, if you really want high accurate results. No way you can do it with a four-state model, right? Um, what I mean by small is maybe 20 or something like this states, right? Whereas if you talk about typical large spaces in like quantum chemistry, right, like you can go up to hundreds or thousands of orbitals, right? Which I think it's just like one or two orders of magnitude larger. But I totally agree, right? If you if you go down to a small active space, you will definitely pay with accuracy, right? Um, exactly. And so one other thing is that. Um, also, in contrast to maybe the most quantum chemical approaches, is like usually the, the mean field method of choice for quantum chemistry is Hartree-Fock, right? But the problem is for many of these uh, semiconductors, um, not to talk about metallic systems, right, is that um, when you do Hartree-Fock for um, a diamond, for example, you'll find it has a band gap of like 12 or 13 electron volts, right? And so you need to add a lot of, you know, the screening is roughly proportional to one over the band gap, right? So you need to add a lot of empty orbitals to basically get the screening right to push back the, the, the error you make by having a way to a large band gap. And so that also makes DFT as a starting point for us at least interesting because the, the starting point is at least qualitatively correct, right? The, the electronic structure is okay, of course, depending on what you're looking at. And of course, we can make use of existing DFT methodology to describe defects. You know, there's a long, long history in the, the past 20, 30 years. Um, okay, so let me just quickly start talking about some of the results. So 
what we, the first thing we again looked at is basically this, um, the NV minus center. So here's basically a sketch of, of how the experimental energy diagram looks like. So you have these two triplet states. These are separated by, you know, roughly a 2 EV. And then basically you have these two singlet states. And so um, one thing basically one needs to, to make sure is that the CRPA is basically uh, converged. So what I'm showing you here are results for no double counting. I'll come to that in a second. But you just want to show that, you know, basically by controlling the number of bands per atom, which controls the number of empty bands, you kind of quickly converge to a reasonable uh, number for um, these states, so you don't need that many. And also, you know, if you change the number of atoms in the supercell, so we went up to 500, but, um, you know, this error here is not that large. So even for smaller cells, you could use it as an educated, you know, guess. Of course, it depends on what, what your, um, what accuracy you want to have. And also, um, we were interested in basically um, seeing if this idea that we had that, you know, if you have a state that transforms as a non-trivial representation of the point group is actually strongly correlated, so what you can do, you can define a basis-independent multi-reference marker where basically you take the single particle density matrix and calculate the trace of, you know, rho minus rho squared. And if you have a complete product state, then this thing should be zero because rho is idempotent. But you can basically for, depend, if you know how many orbitals you have, you can basically find what the maximum of this lambda arm r is. And so for the case of NV minus, the maximally entangled state should have something like um, lambda equal to 1.5. And so these two singlet states here, they have a lamb uh, lambda of one. So that means they are rather strongly correlated, right? So trying to describe these by um, single reference methods is probably not a good idea. Okay. Then um, the other thing that we looked at is basically understanding the dependence of the DFT functional. Again, this was mostly for us to, you know, um, we wanted to reproduce what has been done in the literature, but also just understand what people have done. And so, you know, the, the, the dashed lines here are using um, HSE as a starting point, and then the solid lines are basically PBE. And so if you include no double counting, basically, you know, HSE has some hartree fock exchange in there, so it's not surprising, but basically you get a very, very large difference in, in um, basically the excitation energy, so, you know, the energy that needs from the ground state to the triplet state here. And um, um, basically these models here is just, trying to take away certain parts of the Coulomb tensor to see how these results change. Um, but it turns out, you know, um, you basically need to almost take into account all the Coulomb interactions. So, you know, this U is just you have one on-site interaction, nothing else. So that would be the Hubbard model, right? This is basically some density-density and one simple exchange and so on. So you can make it even simpler. But you kind of see there's like significant differences in the energy, um, qualitatively and quantitatively meaningful differences. So. Um, Maybe that also goes back to what Julia said, you know, like simplifying things sometimes costs you a lot of um, accuracy. Well, I mean, we have found that the, de the dependence on the functional depends on the double counting curve. You have yeah. double counting that is not hard to fork anymore. That dependence goes away. Exactly. So that basically brings me to the next slide, right? Um, I think you're talking about the, you use the GW, right? And then you can eliminate this. Yeah, this is something we also thought about, but we haven't um, done anything on this yet. But it, it sounds very, very interesting because I think that's one of the, to me, intrinsic problems of these kind of methods, right? Because you will never basically have a, an exact double counting expression for um, these cases. You know, maybe as I said, you get lucky if you can find something um, using, comparing it to like uh, really highly accurate methods, but there's still a lot of systematic work to be done. But basically what, what our idea, what we should do is basically if you use um, just a double counting that is basically a, um, for, for the GGA, you know, GGA is basically a um, not orbital dependent uh, functional, right? And so um, what it basically has is mostly some sort of like Coulomb interaction described through the Hartree term, right? So, uh, the one idea is to just basically use, this is basically the Fock matrix describing only Hartree terms. And so if you use this as a double counting correction, you can basically take the PBE results and then remove the Hartree term um, through double counting. And then you get something that is close-ish to experiment, right? So at least this is like one systematic way of doing it. Of course, you know, if you use HSE, um, because HSE has some screened um, Fock exchange, right? The thing becomes a little bit more complicated. So what you could do is you can just take the Fock matrix and take the exchange and then um, kind of guesstimate that there's maybe a term in front of um, the exchange term, right? And so 
in, in, in HSE, this, like, this mixing is usually, uh, I think, 0 0.3, 0 0.35 or something like this. So if you, uh, 0.25, sorry. So what you know, many groups have done and what we've also uh, basically looked at is at if you take your HSE uh, calculation and then basically either subtract the full part where you take alpha to one, or then just subtract the part of Hartree Fock that is in the, uh, the um, functional by design, you also get something that is rather close to experiment. And um, you know, now it actually brings closer together the PBE and HSE result, which is what we want, right? We want something that is at least um, independent of the basis. And you know, you know, there, there's, I think the way I think about the double counting is that their double counting will give you an error bar on your results, right? Like, so I don't think we can really claim like milli electron volt accuracy or something like this. So this is more about, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 EV uh, right now for this kind of method, right? Okay, so, um, oh yeah, these stars here basically represent other, other references. Um, and just to see that our implementation of this is, gives us basically the same result. Um, and so for us, this was at least, you know, showing that we, we did it correctly and that, you know, we could reproduce the NV minus center a little bit bet better. But then we thought maybe we should actually go back to something that's a little bit more simple. You know, maybe we can understand what's going on a little bit better. And so then we went back to um, hexagonal boron nitrate. So, you know, hexagonal boron nitrate is one of the mo um, more famous um, platforms for quantum defects in recent years because it's two-dimensional. They're extremely well-defined single photon emitting um, defects in there. Um, there's many candidates for these, but as far as I know, there's no real, you know, experimental or theoretical proof what it might be. So there's many candidates out there. And one of these candidates is basically the CNBN um, defect, which is basically you replace a boron and a nitrogen with carbon. So you basically have a carbon dimer in your boron nitrate, right? And so what you do is, um, this has been proposed as one of, of the origin of one of the, some of these, um, these uh, single photon emitters. And so when you do a, just like a simple DFT calculation with this defect, you'll again find you know, the valence band, conduction band separated by a large gap. And then basically there are two states, one fully filled B2 state and then a fully filled B2 star state. So star just means anti-bonding. Um, how can we understand this? This is basically you know, the, the, the in-plane, um, so you have sp3 um, hybridized orbitals in plane that, or sp2 hybridized orbitals in plane that bond with a boron nitride, and then you have the PZ orbitals of the carbon, and they can form a bonding and anti-bonding pair, right? So this is really, you know, a very, very simple type of defect, but we also thought this is, um, because it's so simple, you know, we should, should investigate a little bit more and understand what's going on. And also, you can kind of map this back to like a two-side Hubbard model, um, because basically it has the same phenomenology. And so if you just did a, a two-side Hubbard model, right, um, if you have a bonding and anti-bonding state, you can write down all the six many body states for two electrons, you know, really easily. You have a ground state where the bonding orbital is completely filled. You have a triplet state. Um, you have a, a highly high energetic um, singlet state um, with closed shell. And then you have basically, you know, the, the MS0 triplet and then um, a singlet, which is basically a linear combination of these guys, right? So that's pretty obvious. And so um, what we basically then just did is to check if we actually get these states and if we, if we can correlate this to something. But more importantly also is how do these states converge with different parameters? So for example, here you see that while the energies converge rather fast with like the number of bands per atom, so this is um, for a fixed number of atoms, there seems to be some oscillation in terms of atoms, number of atoms in the super, in the supercell, right? So you, you can make it very, very large, but it still seems to oscillate. And what we found the reason for this is actually is that um, the CRPA um, goes into, gives you basically slightly different results depending on the supercell, but you can basically get, get over that by introducing some sort of K points. So if you take number of K points times number of atoms as some sort of like effective parameter, you can see that this thing really converges well, right? And again, um, looking at like what what um, the double counting does here. So if we just use, um, if we just use uh, our no double counting, we find the, basically that there's a singlet ground state, then there's a triplet here. There's this like highly excited, um, basically this is this triplet and then this is the open shell singlet and this is the highly energetic uh, other singlet. And basically if you just, um, 
basically use Hartree Fock double counting, the energy will just be shifted, but the energy difference is roughly the same, or you know, the difference between these states is roughly the same. But then we also wanted to bring it again in accordance with like, see if this idea of, you know, for HSE, you just use this alpha 0.25, and for GGA, you just use an, the Hartree term. And you can basically see, you know, we get roughly the same numbers if we use the Hartree term for um, PBE, and for HSE, we need, uh, take a, um, a hybrid double counting. But actually, you know, this is one of the things, um, to get really good um, accuracy, basically one has to use alpha 2.4. So, you know, there doesn't seem to be like a universal value of this alpha. So, you know, this is again one of these problems that one then, one needs to tune these things, which makes predictions very hard, right? Because I could give you a prediction of the zero phonon line is something like 5 EV, 3.5, or 4, right? And so you can kind of fit anything to it, right? And so that is something that we want to study in the future a little bit more, together with this more highly accurate uh, models, right? Like, can we find out if we can really um, get an exact double counting? Um, we've kind of done something like this. So there's been some work by one of us, Malte Rosner, who's, who's basically worked on um, mapping like the two-side Hubbard model onto an exact Concham system, and then one can extract um, you know, some, some sort of double counting, Daimler double counting, which I'm not gonna go into many details here. And that does rather well but it's, it's also not perfect. So I think, personally, I think there needs way more things need to be done. Okay, and so, you know, you've, what I take from this as, you know, somebody who's very interested in describing these things, I, I'm already very happy if I get qualitatively right results, right? Like quantitatively, of course, would be very good, but you have to work very hard for this. But what we also thought is like, you know, these were some very, very minimal models. So can we find something where this thing goes completely wrong, right? Like, so, um, this is maybe just that hexagonal boron nitride and uh, NV minus just like happened to work, right? And so then, you know, there's been a lot of works in studying, you know, iron or other transition metals and also some 3.5 semiconductors. So uh, the reason we use, um, basically we substitute an aluminum by an iron and then look at aluminum nitride is basically that um, the, the d orbitals of the iron will just be in the gap of aluminum nitride. So this should also be, you know, ideal for our method. For example, if you use gallium nitrate, then some of these states will actually be in the valence band, and so then there, there are a lot of ambiguities which orbitals you localize and so on. So we didn't want to get into this. The reason why I'm showing you is this, that even this very, very simple model has extreme difficulties for such a simple system, right? And so, you know, this is basically, you know, you could ask this in a general chemistry class. You say, okay, you have an iron atom, it's in a C3V crystal field, you know, what are the level splittings gonna be, right? Like, you see that there's two degenerate states, two degenerate states, and then a singly degenerate state. So it starts with a tetrahedral symmetry and then goes into the Wurtzite structure, so it breaks from TD to C3V. So, you know, that's basically what you uh, would expect. And so we can compare our results to crystal field theory or tanabe zugano diagrams that you know, in inorganic chemists basically already did a long, long, long time ago. And so, you know, what, what do we find? So if we start basically with a free atom, we get the, the term symbol for the D electrons. And so then if you would put it in a TD crystal field, you would get these, this set of many body states here. And then if you further break down the TD crystal field to a C3V, because aluminum nitride here is in the Wurtzite structure, right? You would basically expect this kind of level ordering. This follows from just um, regular Lingen field theory, and basically we calculated all these Arabs and so on, um, basically using just like simple representations. Um, what we find, however, is that this ordering of the states differs quite a bit depending on what you use, right? So there are some, um, Difference, for example, if you even if you just look at uh, TD, um, in in what you would expect from a ligand field diagram, you would find that you have a T1 state here, but here you find a T2. Then there's suddenly a T2 state here um, expected from ligand field theory, but then here we find you know an A1 and an E state and so on. So there already are some discrepancies between what we're doing, and so. Um, Basically, this is, can be one of the predictions of the methods if we you know, use it in the same way we've just used it. We say like, um, you would, from these methods that you know, inorganic chemists use for molecular um, you know, complexes where you just have a transition metal atom and then there are some ligands around this, right? You can very accurately predict what the level structure should be. But maybe if you put an, an iron in this aluminum nitride, actually this level structure would be very, very different. So that's some sort of quote unquote um, prediction. But there's a caveat in that that's the following is that we found an extreme dependence on um, which starting point we used, right? Because the, the starting point uh, here is because you have an odd number of electrons, 
it's iron uh, three plus, so it's D five, right? Um, you can either do a PBE calculation where you basically use a restricted calculation where you um, occupy these orbitals all with the same weight. You know, you kind of um, flush out the uh, the weight, and then you get basically the following level diagram. You can also do an HSE uh, calculation, but the problem is that DFT um, will converge into something a little bit different than PBE, and actually you cannot really converge into the same kind of solution, right? So there's already, if you want to compare different starting points, there's a problem. And what we found is that if you use, um, you know, one argument to actually use restricted calculation is that you don't want to introduce any more um, 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 terms that DFT adds that you cannot exactly um, pull out again, right? Um, but the problem is if you do this, then HSE sometimes converges into completely unphysical uh, solutions that then are a very, very bad starting point for this, right? So um, this is, again, just to highlight that there, I, I think in our uh, opinion, if you want to use this like, method, which is very fast and very, um, and very um, you know, applicable, widely applicable, there's a lot of dependence and things that I think have not been understood, at least from our point of view. I mean, what, what Julia did, trying to get rid of the starting point dependence by using GW and so on definitely seems to be the way, right? Because just describing an iron atom and aluminum nitride should be possible, at least quantitatively. Okay, so with that, I'm done. Um, basically, what I wanted to show you is that basically how, how we thought about this like, kind of embedding method that, you know, I, we're not claiming that we invented them, but we wanted to understand this a little bit better. better. Um, the reason we wanted to really use this is because there's the possibility to to extend this methodology to you know, structural properties, dynamical properties, and so on, because of the small Hilbert space, right? But for that, we need to understand how big the errors are we are making. And what I think what we found, of course, is that the double counting and the dependence of the DFT functional are, for now, the biggest challenges for really predictive modeling, right? If you have some experimental data, you can tune some knobs and make it kind of um, um, uh, agree. But if I give you a blind, if you give you a blind challenge, right, like predict me what this defect is in this host material. Uh, it is still extremely hard for these kind of ab initio methods, right? Like, and I don't know of any method right now that could really do that, um, at least to my knowledge. Okay, and with that, thank you for your questions and your attention. <laughs>